When I told my father, who's been a car mechanic for over 40 years, that I'm getting a Suzuki in for review, he told me it's one of the most reliable brands out there. Now, indeed, he is quite right, because if you look at the recent surveys, Suzuki actually tops the list and even surpasses Toyota. And Toyota is quite relevant in this review because the Toyota RAV4 is very similar to the Suzuki Acros. Now, I can't really talk about reliability, but I can talk about the overall efficiency and what you're actually getting for the price. And here, the Suzuki Acros costs around 46 and a half thousand pounds. So what does that money get you? Well here the Suzuki A-Cross is actually quite intriguing. See it not only has the ability to be plugged in but also has self-charging capabilities. Now why is this of importance? Well let's say you're going on a longer excursion. You've plugged in at home or at work and of course after a little while you're going to run out of charge. Now in a regular plug-in hybrid such as let's say the Citroen C5 Aircross here you will be reducing your fuel efficiency and therefore consuming more fuel on the go because you are lugging around heavy batteries. Now, if you have only a self-charging hybrid, such as the likes of, let's say, the Honda HRV or even the Toyota RAV4 self-charging hybrid, here the Suzuki Acros will run more efficiently while it still has some charge. Effectively, it's combining the best of both worlds and optimizing and bettering the experience when you're on the move. And we think that's actually one of the best hybrid systems that we've reviewed to date. And well, it just makes it stand out in comparison to its competitors. Now that's all well and good in terms of specs and knowing how it works, but what does that ultimately lead to? Well, here we roughly got a 55 miles per gallon, and that's from its 55 litre fuel tank, which honestly is not too bad given the size of the vehicle. It's not exactly class leading, but equally, if you're going to be doing longer excursions, as we mentioned, then here it will actually be a lot more efficient than a regular plug-in hybrid due to its self-charging capabilities. Now, the other thing to consider is that the vehicle will run for roughly 400 to 500 miles on a single tank. And of course here, due to its self-charging capabilities, is constantly going on its EV portion as well. So here, effectively, you can run without having to stop and still be as efficient as possible while running on the Suzuki Acros, which isn't the same thing that we would have said if you were having a different car. So what we should say here is that Suzuki should be really commended for what they've done and in combination with Toyota, because it is a lot of Toyota systems here, it is a really efficient SUV. So with that in mind, how far can you go on pure electric power? Well, in our mixed driving test, we had around 35 miles and it was actually stretching towards sometimes 40 miles. It really depends as to where and how you're driving. Now, in order to re-attain energy back into the battery pack, other than via its self-charging capabilities, you do have regenerative braking. And this can be adjusted on the fly via the flappy paddles found behind the steering wheel. So right now, if I were to tap on it, we go to level four, level three, level two, and level one, which is the harshest mode. And it's therefore bringing the car to a, well, near enough standstill. The only problem, however, is as soon as you put your foot down back on the accelerator pedal or indeed the brake pedal is going to reset and therefore now we're back onto drive mode and the regenerative braking mode has gone all together. So therefore you're gonna have to do that each time while you're on the move. Now there's a sort of complaint here, but also a, well, something that should be commended because unlike some other plug-in hybrids, you don't actually have the ability to adjust the regenerative braking at all and also or you don't even have the ability to run on regenerative braking, in other words, to recoup energy back into the battery pack. So yet again, Suzuki should be commended for this. Now, of course, you have the ability to plug in the vehicle via the Type 2 port. And unlike the previous versions, which were limited to a 3.3 kilowatt input, the vehicle now has the upgraded 6.6 kilowatt onboard charger, which is the same as the Toyota RAV4 hybrid. And as such means that you can go from zero to 100% in roughly two and a half hours. So with all of that said, what about when it comes to its performance? Well, here the large size SUV is actually surprisingly nippy. We had it tested via RaceLogic's V-Box sports at 5.94 seconds and in pure ev mode this raises up to 9.8 seconds 
Now this is thanks to the combination that the manufacturer offers. There's a 2.5 litre four cylinder front mounted engine and this outputs on its own 136 kilowatts and 227 newton meters of torque. But then when it's combined with the front 134 kilowatts and rear 40 kilowatt motors, they output 225 kilowatts and that equates to a whopping 302 horsepower. As for your top speed, it's limited to 112 miles an hour, which should certainly suffice for a lot of consumers. Now, when you are putting your foot down to the metal, you might notice the ECVT transmission kicking in, and that's due to the pulleys adjusting the gears as such. Now, here you do have six gears or virtual gear shall we say to go through and you can adjust it on the fly when you go on to S mode and therefore allows you the adjustments. If you don't want to do that you can rely on the vehicle doing it itself and frankly we think it will suffice for a lot of people. Specifically if you go on the sport mode which you can select through the center console and this will give you a little bit more of a responsive accelerator pedal, stiffen up the steering wheel and also make those virtual gears or shall we say those pulleys respond a little bit faster. We suspect most people will probably go on the normal or eco modes whereby here all of these do become a little bit slower and a bit laggy but again will suffice when you are pottering in and around town. Now this actually brings us on to the handling characteristics of the vehicle. It does have an all-wheel drive setup due to the front and rear motor and of course that front mounted engine which then give you that confidence when you're going on outdoor trails. In fact it's got a a dedicated trail mode if you want to select it which you can press via the center console but aside from that when it comes to just driving on country roads you will notice quite significant amount of body roll now of course this is when you're going at a faster speed and therefore really pushing it around corners which is not something we suspect most people who own the Suzuki Acros will be doing but it's just something that we thought to mention whereby it doesn't compete with the sportier plug-in hybrids out there on the the market. That said, what is absolutely fantastic and buttery smooth and something that we really love for example of the Citroen C5 Aircross is the suspension system. Here it's really smooth and therefore means that of course you are resulting in a bit of body lean when you're going around corners but when you're going in and around town and going over speed bumps like we're doing right now, or even if you're going over potholes or anomalies, you're not gonna really feel it. The suspension system is constantly working and provides a real great experience. It's not quite as floaty as the Citroen nor the likes of the Audi e-tron with its fully air suspension system but it's still up there with one of the most comfortable SUVs that we've driven to date. Now another aspect to consider when it comes to the driving comfort is the in-cabin experience and here the Suzuki Acros is actually surprisingly well insulated. You do hear a little bit of tyre noise creeping in and also wind deflecting at higher speeds and you can also hear the eCVT transmission thrashing away at the front of the vehicle but it's nowhere near as audible as the likes of the Honda HRV. Now, this actually does perfectly lead us onto the audio system and here as standard you get a six speaker configuration that outputs roughly 120 watts. What we'll say in a nutshell is that we're actually left a little bit disappointed. We're expecting a little bit more from Suzuki and for budding audio files out there, you'll actually find yourself somewhat disappointed. It is also a shame that there's no means of actually upgrading the Across's audio system. And as such, you're just left with a six speaker configuration only. Now, if you want a detailed breakdown of the sound measurements that were recorded within the Suzuki Across and also our detailed breakdown of the sound frequency range, do check out our detailed audio review that can be found up on your pop banner down the description below or indeed in the pinned comments. Now for you to tinker around with the audio settings, you'll want to navigate on the nine inch infotainment system, which is planted at the center of the dashboard. It's a shame not to see it slightly angled towards the driver. We suspect this is kind of a cost saving feature when it comes to different markets. Nevertheless, the infotainment system is very intuitively laid out and very simple to navigate. In fact, it might be a little bit too simple for certain individuals because Suzuki has excluded in terms of built-in maps and therefore you'll have to resort to using Android Auto or Apple CarPlay 
which are both supported on a wired format. It is a shame, however, that a wireless format on these third-party operating systems is not supported. Given the fact that you don't have that built-in maps function, it might have reduced the clutter that you have at the front of the center console. Nevertheless, when it comes to using it here, we found it to be very responsive, and we should point out that the resolution of the screen isn't too high, which is, again, somewhat surprising given the overall cost of the vehicle. Now, transitioning towards the instrument cluster, there's yet again a little bit of a baffling sort of way that Suzuki have got around this because they've included a part digital and part analog display, and therefore you still have these physical dials. Given the fact that this vehicle is probably aimed for people who have Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, and therefore more in terms of the digital age, you might have expected a fully digitalized instrument cluster, and unless that's not the case. Furthermore, there is no Android Auto or Apple CarPlay map navigation that actually feeds into the instrument cluster, and therefore you don't get even turn-based signals. As for a head-up display, it's completely omitted altogether, and there's no means of actually adding it in. Another potential selling point of the RAV4, whereby in its higher trim, does actually have the option. So while the manufacturer has omitted a fully digitalized instrument cluster and head-up display, it's absolutely fantastic to see that they've retained physical climate controls, and this makes it far more intuitive to use on the go. You have got a flurry of buttons found towards the gear selector as well. Now this actually perfectly leads us on to the storage within the cabin. And at the front of the center console, you've got a small area for your smartphone, and you'll also find a USB type A port, which can connect up to the infotainment system, and also a 12 volt socket, which can be handy to power a dash cam. If you want our favorites, you can find it down in the description below. Further down the center console, you've got two cup holder units, and then you've also got the center armrest compartment, which should suffice for a lot of consumers. You've then got the glove compartment, and then all four door bins will be large enough to fit a 500 milliliter bottle, whereby the front two will be also large for a set of valuables, such as a wallet or a small to medium sized purse. Now, our only complaint, however, is the fact that the most of these areas areas that we've talked about other than the center console armrest area don't have a sort of fabric lining or a non-slip bay and as such if you have keys or loose chains you're going to hear them rattling around which does dampen the overall in-cabin experience. Now, of course, when it comes to storage, we have to talk about boot capacity. And here you've got an electric tailgate with hands-free operation that comes fitted as standard. You've got a button found within the cabin, a button found on the remote, you've got the kick function, and you've also got a button found just above the number plate. Now, what you'll notice that even though I've pressed it, it takes a while to come up. You just want it to come up a little bit faster. And the same when it comes to closing the tailgate. Sometimes I've walked quite a distance and I can still see the Suzuki A-Cross's tailgate closing down. I just felt like it should be a lot faster. Nevertheless, when it does open up, you do have this hatchback design. It makes it very convenient to load in and out goods. And better still, you don't have a raised boot lip, which makes it even more convenient when you have pets. Now, when it comes to the total capacity, you've got 490 liters of usable space. And if you were to pop down the seats, this extends up to 1,168 liters, which should certainly suffice for a lot of consumers. Now, in terms of the rear seats, they've got a 60-40 split folding design, and you've also got a boot cover, which is retractable. Now, even better is that you've got a very large underfloor compartment storage. Now, this can also fit a spare wheel, which does come included and can be useful if you get a flat tire, like I did. Nevertheless, if you don't have a flat tire or you don't want to have a spare wheel and you want to run the risk, then you can actually use this storage space for, let's say, your shopping bags or even your charging cables. Now, aside from boot capacity, what is really impressive is the headroom and legroom that one can get within the Suzuki a cross not only at the front of the cabin but also at the rear here is someone who's just under six foot so i can pretty much extend my legs i've got no issues whatsoever and as for a headroom i think even if i was seven foot tall i just wouldn't feel hemmed in it's absolutely class leading now to even better the experience suzuki have kept the transmission tunnel to a minimum and as a result means that the rear middle occupants can pretty much put their feet down flat and not have to worry about the rear outer occupants either and it's just overall better as the experience on longer excursions. Now, if you're not going to use the rear middle seat, you can reveal an armrest with two cup holders. In terms of convenience, you do also have two USB Type-C ports found towards the rear portion of the center console, which is useful for charging. Now, elsewhere, you do have the rear outer seats and the front two and the steering wheel all heated, and that comes fitted as standard, which is absolutely fantastic to see. Better still, the driver has got eight-way electronic controls, and then all the seats themselves are very comfortable and also accommodating. 
devastating. Now another thing we absolutely love about the Suzuki A-Cross is visibility. Not only as the driver whereby front, side and rear views are all very large and easy to see, but also as passengers. No matter if you're sat at the front or at the back, you've got very large windows and also clever cutouts that the automaker has included. Now when it comes to parking, you've got a 10.4 meter turning circle, which is actually pretty small and therefore makes the large size SUV very easy to maneuver. And you've also got front and rear parking sensors and also a rear view camera and therefore takes the stress away when you are doing a certain complex parking maneuver. On that note, we should mention that you do also have rear cross traffic alert and therefore if you are reversing into a space that's kind of off your blind spot, then you can rest assured that the sensors are going to be working and therefore notify you before you head on to a oncoming motorist. Now all the things we've just mentioned are actually fitted as standard and better still, so are all the driver assistance systems. Here you've got the likes of speed limiter, lane departure warning and mitigation, steering assist and the likes of roadside recognition. Now to top it off, you do also have adaptive radar cruise control, which we absolutely love. Here it regulates the distance from the leading vehicle, keeps you centered and also integrates stop and go technology, which means that when you're going on, well, slightly more mundane motorway commutes and there's a lot of traffic it's going to come to a complete standstill and then resume when you put your foot down very gently on the accelerator pedal this is a great inclusion by suzuki and the fact that all of these things that we've just mentioned come fit to the standard is something that they should certainly be commended about now finally we should also mention its exterior design whereby we think at the front and at the rear it's pretty stylish although the black plastic wheel arches do detract from the vehicle's otherwise pretty sporty look here you've got 19 inch alloys that come fit to the standard elsewhere you have the option to choose between the white, silver, grey, black, blue and the pictured red colour finishes, all of which are completely free to switch in between. As for the top of the vehicle, there are built-in roof rails and towards the rear you do also have a privacy glass giving your occupants a little bit of extra peace of mind and or if you're going to be storing goods frequently towards the rear of the cabin. So with all of that in mind it brings us on to our verdict and quite frankly the Suzuki A-Cross ticks a lot of boxes, be it in terms of a practicality point of view, the raw performance and of course when it comes to the overall fuel efficiency and furthermore the convenience of having a self-charging technology and also the ability to plug it in. However, it is going to be a little bit of a tough sell at £46,000 because here you should consider some of the alternatives. If you have the ability to charge at home or conveniently charge at work, then you might want to look at just a pure plug-in hybrid which will give you the same sort of performance and range and yet come in at a much cheaper price tag. The one that comes to mind is the Citroen C5 Aircross. Then you have got the likes of self-charging hybrids if you don't have the excess of plugging it in then something like this might not actually make that much sense and you might want to save yourself a lot of money and get the Honda HRV instead. While there are some limitations with that vehicle, of course, there are some sort of benefits that you should consider, including its price tag. Then you've got the likes of the Toyota RAV4 self-charging hybrid, and then you've also got its sibling, the Toyota RAV4 plug-in hybrid. So it's not to say that the Suzuki A-Cross is a bad vehicle. Far, far from it. I'm actually really impressed with what they've actually achieved, but it's just really the overall price that it comes in at. If you are looking for a self-charging hybrid that you can also plug in, and you also want to have that ability to reduce your benefiting kind taxation, if you're buying this as a company car, then arguably the Suzuki A-Cross and the Toyota RAV4 plug-in hybrid make for a fantastic option. Now, I'll be intrigued to hear your thoughts down in the comments section below. And if you've liked this independent detail review, definitely do consider dropping a like, subscribing and hitting that bell notification, all of which really helps the channel. As such, I've been Chris from Total EV, and I'll hopefully see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.